Now, in the last 15 minutes or so we have, we're just going to give you a brief introduction to uh, chapter 10, or lecture 10, I should say. Now, we're, we're at the hump, meaning we're halfway through. Yay. Um, so, we're, we're at the lecture 10 point. There are 19 lectures, so we're pretty much right in the middle here. We've gone through the first two characteristics of life, which is how life is organized and how life uses energy. We've talked a little bit about how life maintains homeostasis, and we'll continue to talk about how life maintains homeostasis uh, through these processes, but what was the fourth step? What was the fourth characteristic of life that we learned back in lecture one? All living things must reproduce. Good. Reproduce, grow, um, <clears throat> repair, and the like, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, in fact, the next six lectures are purely on that. I mean, when you think biology, you usually think reproduction, because we devote most of our time and energy to that process. I'm not just talking about sex, I'm talking about other factors. All right, so what's included in these? What's included in reproduction? Well, we're going to talk about cancer. We're going to talk about um, what we call biotechnology, where we look at stem cells and, uh, and genetic manipulation and things of that sort. So when we talk about reproduction, we primarily look at the inheritance of DNA from one generation to the next. So this also brings into effect a process called mitosis, which is cellular reproduction. Also meiosis, which is sexual reproduction. And we'll look at inheritance, which is the passing on of our genetics through either sexual or asexual reproduction from one generation to the next. So you can see there's a lot of topics that are covered by this one characteristic of life. So what is lecture 10 all about? Well, in order to understand what causes cancer and why cells become cancerous and what mitosis and meiosis is and how you inherit genetic material and how you manipulate the genetics and how you inherit the genetics, we first have to talk about the genetics. So that's what this lecture is all about. What is DNA and how does DNA work? How does it get inherited? What makes it up? How does it encode information? The main purpose or two processes that are going to be found in this lecture are shown right there. Transcription and translation. No matter how many times I hammer this home, people still get those two words confused. So, let me give you a precursor to it. Back in the days before they had copiers, the monks tediously read the scriptures and other types of uh, documents and copied them. Transcription, or to transcribe something, is a copying process. So, transcription is when a cell copies its DNA. Now, there's two ways in which this can be done that we're going to go over through this lecture. The second word is translation. What do you think of when you think of translation? To translate something. One language to another language, okay? so. When you translate something from one language to another language, like in Spanish to English or Russian to Chinese or whatever the case may be, um, you're, you're literally you know, doing words that mean the same but in different languages. Well, that's the same thing here with DNA. We're going to show how DNA gets copied into RNA and RNA gets translated into a protein. Because remember, DNA and RNA are the same group. They're in the nucleic gases group. So when you copy one to the other, transcription, that's a copying process. However, when the ribosome reads the RNA and turns it into a protein, that's translation. These are two separate biological groups. If you think of them as two separate languages, which they really are, then that's what the ribosome is. It's the translator. It's the one that says, okay, here's the RNA information. Here's how I make the protein. So those are the two processes we're primarily going to focus on, transcription and translation. So before we can get to that, we first have to have a really good understanding about what DNA is and how it's encoded. How do we, 
have information contained in these biological molecules. Now, you're going to see a lot of scientists uh, as we discuss some of these things, and I'm not so interested in having you memorize history, but it is good to mention uh, how uh, recently we've discovered these things. Now, I know the 1950s may not be recent for most of you, but that's not that long ago, which means we have only scratched the surface in the last 60 uh, some odd years of DNA. It wasn't until 1953 that we even knew what DNA looked like. Then it was another two decades before we could start manipulating DNA. And then it was another two decades after that before we could actually start uh, um, reading it. And now here, a decade or so later, we can do amazing things with it. So it is increasing exponentially as far as our ability to manipulate DNA and understand it. But it wasn't that long ago that we discovered DNA. Now I say we. Watson and Crick are the ones given the Nobel Prize, but I like to make mention too of Rosalind Franklin. Uh, she was a scientist of her day, which was actually rare back in those days. And we have a lot more women scientists today, but that was a rarity back then to have uh, someone that uh, was very well established. Now, she died of cancer before the, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize was given out, otherwise she would have been awarded as well. She was the one that gave Watson and Crick that last piece, which was that double helix structure that DNA uh, is found and they were missing one last little piece. All right, so let's look at how DNA is organized and what it looks like and how it contains the information that it contains. Now, if you remember back from uh, when we studied organic molecules, DNA is a polymer made of monomers. The monomers are called nucleotides. The nucleotides are made up of three fundamental parts. Do you remember what they were? Phosphate, sugar, and a nitrogenous base. That is a nucleotide. Those are the monomers or the building blocks of nucleic acids, whether it's DNA or RNA. Now, if it's DNA, you have a deoxyribose sugar. If it's RNA, you have a ribose sugar. That's the main difference between DNA and RNA, although there are some more subtle differences as well. Now, the nitrogenous bases, because they've got a lot of nitrogen in them, there are four for DNA. We call them adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, A, T, C, and G. So the first thing that you're going to have to know is that DNA being a double helix ladder, the opposing strands have what we call complementary nucleotides, which mean that the, new, uh, the bases will actually pair with one another uh, in a certain way. A's always pair with T's and C's always pair with G's, okay? That is the universal, uh, what we call, base pairing rule. So if you see a T on one side of the DNA, you know that the other side's gonna have an A. If you see a G on one side, you know the other side's gonna have a C. Those are the universal pairing rules. Anybody ever see the movie Gattaca? Wanna know where it got its name from? Yeah, basically the basis of DNA. Because um, the, the movie's about DNA and genetics and all that. Anyway. Um, okay. So what holds DNA together is hydrogen bondings. And the reason for that is because the only way that DNA can be read, like a book, is to be constantly opened up and shut. Okay? Some of you may not have ever opened your book this semester, or you may not even have it. But for those who do have your book, you know that you open and shut it a lot. Well, if the pages were glued together, it'd be very difficult to open and close your book and be able to access that information. So hydrogen bonds allows the DNA to be held together as a long string of polymers, um, but is weak enough that enzymes can come in here and unzip it, read it, and then put it back together. So that's why the, the double helix is actually held together by hydrogen bonds, is because it's constantly being opened up and put back together for various reasons, primarily to access the genetic information. All living things on this planet have DNA, but the DNA is organized a little differently depending upon the type of cell. For example, prokaryotic cells, which are the more simple cells, tend to have a circular DNA that is their genome. Now, they're much simpler, so they don't have as many um, what we call genes as you and I, 
Um, but their DNA is like yours and I, and that is double-stranded. It uses the same nucleotides, A's, T's, C's, and G's. Um, and in fact, <coughs> the code that it uses to store information is no different than yours and I. And this will get into biotechnology where we're actually able to use these cells to manufacture human proteins. We'll show how we can actually take prokaryotic cells, splice a human gene into them, and turn it into, say, human insulin, or human growth hormone, or vaccines, or things of that sort. So due to the similarities and exact nature of how we manipulate and work with our DNA and transcribe it and translate it, um, you'll see how that becomes really important later on. Now, for you and I, we don't have a big, large, circular piece of DNA. We have linear pieces of DNA, which we call chromosomes. Now, the smallest chromosome that you and I have is about 30 million nucleotides long. Some of the longer chromosomes are somewhere around hundreds of millions of nucleotides long. So in every cell in your body, you have about 5 billion nucleotides. That's quite a bit of genetic information. However, scientists are still trying to figure out what a lot of that does. There is 98% of our DNA doesn't encode genes. Now, it doesn't mean that it's called junk DNA, as it has been referred to in the past, but we're still trying to figure out what a lot of it does. We know that there are certain elements within it that are necessary for proper navigation through our DNA, but when you really look at it, only 2% of our DNA actually encodes what we call a gene. Now, you've heard of this before, but let's really define what a gene is. A gene is a sequence of nucleotides that encodes a protein. So what happens is you have your DNA, there's a sequence <coughs> of base pairs, A's, T's, C's, and G's, that we call a gene. It first gets copied into RNA, <coughs> and then that RNA gets translated into the protein. So really, a gene is the genetic information that tells the cell how to make a protein. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we used to think that we had a lot more genes than we actually do. And the reason for that is because when they looked at a cell, they saw that uh, there were hundreds of thousands of different proteins that were made. Now, we knew that we didn't have hundreds of thousands of genes, but since the, uh, the year 2000, so in the last 15 years or so, um, we used to think we had 60,000 genes. Now we know we have somewhere between 20 to 25,000 genes. Okay, so it's actually gone down by a... Uh, one-third uh, in our estimate. We still are not quite sure. One of the biggest problems is we have some remnants of copied genes that we call pseudogenes, and it's hard to tell whether or not we actually use those or whatnot, so that's why we have this range. We're not still not quite sure. Remember I told you, early stages of genetics. Now, of those 20 or to 25,000 genes, we can actually make 20 times the number of proteins, and you'll learn today exactly why that's the case. But that only accounts for about 2% of your genome. So there's 98% of your genome that's used to regulate how those genes are accessed, it protects your DNA, and so on and so forth. Now, here's the core of this, uh, of this lecture. <clears throat> In the nucleus, the DNA stays to be protected from a lot of different factors. Remember, the DNA is the blueprint that the cell needs to essentially make everything that it needs to function. That DNA needs to be highly regulated, and that's what the nuclear envelope's job is. If you remember back from cell biology uh, lecture, it has these pores that regulate what comes in and out. So the DNA really never leaves the nucleus. So how do we get the information from the nucleus out to where you can actually do something with it? Well, that's where one of these first processes we're going to talk about called transcription comes into play. Remember, transcription is a copying process. So what happens is DNA, a part of it will be opened up and copied into what we call complementary nucleotides. Okay, so the RNA will literally be a copy of the DNA. Now then the RNA leaves the nucleus. So transcription occurs here in the nucleus. The DNA stays where it's at. That copy now leaves the nucleus and goes to where the ribosomes are at. Now remember there's multiple places where the ribosomes can be found. They can be free ribosomes in the cytoplasm or they can be found in the rough ER. Now, the ribosomes are the organelles that manufacture the proteins, and this is what you're going to see today and how that's done. Essentially, the ribosome reads the nucleotides. 
the, uh, the sequence of nucleotides and translates that into a sequence of amino acids. So that's the translation process, is that the ribosome will literally read the coding sequence and interpret it to know how, what order to put the protein amino acids in. Now, if you remember from what we learned from organic chemistry, the proteins, the sequence of amino acids, predetermines how the protein's going to fold into that tertiary structure, or maybe it's going to combine with others and form a quaternary structure. Either way, that order of the amino acids predetermines the function of the protein. If you don't get that order right, you don't make the protein right. Here's an analogy. Let's say you have a cookbook <coughs> that's your DNA that essentially makes every protein uh, that a cell ever needs. Well, you don't need all the information all at once. <clears throat> Today, you just want to make brownies. So, you don't want your kid to mess up your core brownie recipe. So you don't let them have access to that cookbook. Instead, you photocopy the recipe of that, those brownies. Then you put your cookbook back in the shelf. It's safe and, and, and secure. Then you can have this. Now, if your child messes this up a little bit, you can just make another copy or whatever the case may be. I just don't let my kids cook with me. Um, so ultimately, the RNA is kind of that copy, that recipe that the cell needs in order to be able to make the protein, in this case, the brownies. Now, your amino acids are all the ingredients. These are the things that go into this. The recipe tells you what order to put these in. Good cook knows that there is a particular order in how things have to go in and get mixed together and whatnot. Now, if you do it correctly, then every time you follow that recipe, you're gonna get what you desire. The right protein, good brownies. However, let's say in the middle of the night, your son goes in and says, I'm gonna screw with you, Dad and changes some of the recipes, instead of a teaspoon of salt, he puts in a cup of salt. Now, the cell, when it reads the genetic information, doesn't know what it was, it just knows what it is. So if something gets changed here and copied, then it's kind of like, well, well I guess it's a cup of salt. And when you do that, every time you follow that recipe, you're gonna screw up your brownies. Now the same principle applies to DNA. When the genetic information gets messed up, we call that a mutation, then what happens is when it gets copied, that, that mistake gets copied. And when it tries to assemble the protein properly, it makes mistakes in the protein assembly. And this is a, the fundamental uh, basis for most genetic disorders, is inherited mutations from one generation to the next where we don't make our proteins properly. And so you'll see the relationship here between DNA and RNA and proteins. Now let's talk about <clears throat> the passing on of genetics before we get into that overall process. When a cell divides, as your cells are constantly doing, you have what we call adult stem cells in all of your organs that are constantly replicating to regenerate your tissues. I mean, that's really one of the reasons why when you get into old age, your skin starts getting wrinkly and your organs start failing is because these cells wear out and stop regenerating your tissues as well as they did when you were a lot younger. So this process of cell division, which we're going to go into more detail later on in lecture 12, uh, before a cell can divide, it first must duplicate all of its genetic information. Now, we all come from a single cell, the zygote. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, we have 46 chromosomes. What will happen is, as we develop as a fetus, the cell will keep dividing, but before it can divide, it has to duplicate all of the genetic material, so that when the cell divides into two, then each cell gets that exact same copy of genetic material. This is one of the reasons why, <clears throat> no matter where you look anywhere in your body, you're gonna have the exact same genetic information. You take a skin sample, you take a blood sample, you take a sample of hair cells, they're all gonna have the exact same genetics in them. Now they don't use the genetics exactly the same and that's why they behave differently, but they all have the same genetics. This is where DNA fingerprinting comes into play. Uh, in the next lecture we'll show how it doesn't matter if you've got a blood sample, you don't have to get a blood sample from somebody, you can take a cheek swab or you can take cells from any part of their body and match it up to that exact same DNA. Now, how does it do this? This is one of the first processes I'm going to test you on. It's called semi-conservative DNA replication. So here's semi-conservative 
DNA replication. Now, before I go through this process, I want to make clear that this process is very complex and uses an army, and I literally mean army, of enzymes, okay? Not just a brigade, not a little, you know, group, an army. But there's only three main ones that are critical that you have to know. So those are the three that I'm going to test you on, obviously. You'll see others in the video I show you. You'll see others in some of these pictures. But there are only three that I'm going to test you on. Now, DNA is double-stranded. Remember, it's held together by hydrogen bonds. So in order to copy the DNA, the first thing that has to happen is the DNA has to be pulled apart. This comes the, the, here comes the first enzyme called DNA helicase. Okay? If you think of the word helix, like the double helix, DNA helicase essentially unwinds the DNA. That's its job. So it comes in and pretty much breaks the hydrogen bonds, splitting the DNA into two separate strands. Okay? So that's one of the first steps that has to happen. The next step is called, or is uh, accomplished by the enzyme DNA polymerase. Now this is one of the more critical enzymes in this process. Now if you think of the word polymer, remember we talked about dehydration synthesis and how monomers are assembled into polymers. That's what this enzyme does. It literally comes in, reads the template DNA, and adds one nucleotide at a time. So it literally covalently bonds the nucleotides in their phosphate sugars and will create the new half of the DNA strand. So if you see, you know, if it comes in here, and let's say on this one template, actually, let me do this. <clears throat> so remember our base pairing rules. What will happen is it will break the strand in half, that's the helicase, Then the polymerase comes in here and says, okay, I see an A, I put a T. I see a T, put an A. I see a G, or a C, I put a G, G, C. On the other side, another polymerase is doing the same thing. It sees a T, ah, it puts an A. It sees an A, puts a T. It sees a G, puts a C. It sees a C, put a G. What do you notice about both of them? They're exactly the same. Because of this process, what happens is what once was one DNA strand now becomes two copies of the original strand. And that's why DNA needs to be double-stranded. And that's one of the um, uh, critical things in its duplication is it splits into two templates. The polymerase comes along, reads both of them, and adds nucleotides in the growing strand. Okay? So, that's why it's called polymerase, is because it builds the new polymer. It adds one nucleotide at a time, connects them together, and forms the long string uh, that will become the second half of the new DNA. Now the reason why it's called semi-conservative is because notice that each DNA strand conserves half of what we call the parent strand. So here, <coughs> what's in black, that's half of the parent strand. It conserves half of that in the new DNA, and then it just uses those as templates to create the other half of the new DNA. Um, now, there's a problem with this process. DNA, like any language, can only be read in one direction. So what ends up happening is when you... When the helicase comes in here and unwinds the DNA, and the polymerase comes in and starts following that and synthesizing the new polymer, that's fine on this strand. But on this strand, the polymerase actually has to go in the other direction. So as the helicase is unwinding it, a new polymerase has to jump on and then go back towards where the other one started. So it ends up creating these broken fragments of polymers. Now, Here's the key thing. Remember we talked about how enzymes only have one job. Polymerase can only add one nucleotide at a time. When it reaches the other broken polymer here, it can't finish that last connection off. And that's where the last enzyme you have to know comes into play. <coughs> yeah. 
<clears throat> it's called DNA ligase. Now this one doesn't really have a good mnemonic to it, so you just have to remember it. So DNA ligase, it ligates or connects those broken polymers. It finishes that last covalent bond that will connect the phosphate and sugar between these two polymers. Now this happens on both sides. In this direction, it occurs on this strand. In this direction, because it goes both ways, helicase unwinds DNA in this direction too, you have the same problem on this half. So both sides are having this issue with having to reconnect the broken polymers. So let me illustrate that <clears throat> just so you can kind of see. So here we'll show helicase going in both directions. So the helicase is unwinding in this direction, it's unwinding in that direction. The polymer up here, let me do this in green. Polymer up here, the polymerase, goes in this direction. Well, it has to come back here and then come back here. So you can see that you get these broken polymers. Same thing here. You had one start going this direction, but then as this opens up, it's got to keep going back towards here. So what ends up happening is you get these fragments that need to be connected together. So that's where the ligase comes in and will basically finish that last covalent bond off between them. So that in the end, when all is said and done, you're going to have two new DNA strands that are carbon copies of each other, unbroken, and these will be the two new uh, double helixes. Then during the process of cell division, these two get separated from one another. One goes into one cell, the other goes into the other cell. That's semi-conservative DNA replication. Let me show you a video. It will illustrate this process as well as the base pairing rules and such that we've gone over. Now, let's look at a little, uh, some of the differences between DNA and RNA. DNA, as we know, is the hereditary material that gets passed on from one generation to the next. RNA, on the other hand, is transient. As we've talked about, when you make that copy, you can just throw that copy away and make another copy later on. Well, that's what the cell does. It makes the RNA, recycles the nucleotides, and remakes a new RNA. So RNA is constantly being made and recycled. Now, here are some of the fundamental differences between DNA and RNA. They both use slightly different sugars in their nucleotides, and that's where they get their name from. The RNA uses what we call ribose sugar, and that's RNA, ribose nucleic acid. DNA uses deoxyribose sugar. The only difference is in oxygen. They're, they're almost identical in that regard. But that's where they get their name from. Deoxyribose nucleic acid, ribose nucleic acid. Now, here's a big difference, and this will be critical. This is where you're going to have uh, at least another test question. DNA only uses A's, T's, C's, and G's. RNA, on the other hand, uses A's, U's, C's, and G's. So there's a fundamental difference in this nucleotide here, in that thymines are the nucleotide, or the base in the nucleotides, that is exclusive to DNA, and uracil is its replacement. It doesn't have thymine and RNA nucleotides. It uses uracil. They are almost exactly the same. There's just a slight methyl group difference between them. And in fact, the base pairing rules are the same. So whereas before, you have A with T, C with G, now you have A with U, C with G. So the base pairing rules are pretty much the same. The only difference is RNA uses uracil and DNA uses thymine. Now how does that work when DNA gets copied into RNA? Because this is what I'll test you on. So let's say that the DNA strand, let's do Gattaca again. That's a fun one. Now let's say that this is the DNA and that this is the template that's being copied into RNA. What would the RNA copy then look like? C. C U, because remember, it doesn't have 
thymines. It only has uracil, but the base pairing rules are the same. Now, if it sees a T, it doesn't get confused. What's it going to put over here? An A, because there are adenines in RNA. U, U G, U. That's what the RNA would look like. So the RNA uses A's, U's, C's, and G's. This is going to be another type of question I'll test you on where I may say, here's the DNA template. What's the RNA strand that's copied from that DNA? And you'll have to remember that fundamental difference between DNA and RNA. A's with U's, uh, G's, with, uh, <coughs> G's with C's, same thing there. So wherever in the RNA would have a T, it has a uracil. RNA also is single-stranded. It's never double-stranded because when it's double-stranded, the, the cell actually chews it up. It needs to be single-stranded to be able to be accessible. You know, even DNA can't be read unless you rip it apart and turn it into a single strand, like we see with there or whatnot. So though DNA is double-stranded for stability reasons and whatnot and copying, RNA has to be single-stranded for it to be accessible as far as information goes. Okay? So those are some of the fundamentals between DNA and RNA. Now, there are multiple types of RNA, and we're only going to talk about three of them. These are the three critical RNAs that are found to be necessary to make a protein. All right? So of these three RNAs, they each vary in their responsibility and their function in the process of making a protein. So you're going to have to, be, have to know what each of those functions are. All right, let's start with mRNA. What does the M stand for? It stands for messenger. This is the RNA which holds the information that the cell needs to make a protein. Meaning, when we copy the DNA, when we copy a gene, that's the messenger RNA. Okay, so when a gene is copied, when that sequence that tells the ribosome what order to put the amino acids in is copied, that's the messenger RNA. Now the messenger RNA is going to be different for every gene. Okay, we have 20 to 25,000 genes, the RNA is going to be different depending upon what gene is being copied. So the messenger RNA ultimately is that blueprint that the cell needs to make the protein to put the amino acids in the right order. Now, rRNA and tRNA are more for the mechanics. These are universal for any protein. They're not specific for any one protein. They're more of the complementary RNAs that help the ribosome to make the protein. So, rRNA actually stands for ribosomal RNA. Back when we learned about organelles, we talked about how organelles are made of different biological groups. Well, guess what? A ribosome which is the organelle that makes proteins, is not pure protein. It's actually a combination of ribosomal RNA, or this nucleic acid, and protein. So these two biological molecules ultimately make up the ribosome. But that's all rRNA is, is a structural component with the proteins that ultimately create the organelle, the ribosome. Okay? So, these rRNAs do vary as well, but not, they don't vary per protein. There's just a couple different versions of rRNA. All you need to know is it, it makes up the, uh, the ribosome with the protein. So that's ribosomal RNA. Now, this is also copied from DNA, but doesn't necessarily have its own genes, so to speak. So there's a segment of DNA that copies the rRNA, but it's like mud and tape, you know, in a wall. It doesn't matter what else you do with it, it's just structural, okay? Now, these are critical, tRNAs. We call them transfer RNAs. These are, are some of the smallest RNAs, and they play a key role in the translation process. Now, the T doesn't stand for translation, it stands for transfer, but if you want to think about it in that terms as well, you can. What's critical about the tRNA is that they bring the amino acids to the ribosome so that the ribosome can create the protein. So the transfer RNAs, the reason why they're called transfer RNAs, is because they transfer the amino acids to the ribosome. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about how and they function, because it's a little more complex than that uh, when they bring the amino acid, but those are the fundamentals for now. So 
The same principle applies here for RNA transcription. Now, when we talked about semi-conservative DNA replication, this is no more than saying DNA transcription. So DNA transcription is when you copy DNA to DNA. RNA transcription is when you copy DNA to RNA. Make sure you know that difference. That will show up on the quiz questions. For example, if I give you that sequence, Gattaca again, and I say, which is the complementary sequence that's created through RNA transcription? Then I'm looking for the complementary RNA from that. If I ask you what's the complementary DNA sequence through DNA transcription, I'm looking for the DNA copy that's done during semi-conservative DNA replication. So do make sure you understand the difference between those two. Now here's another fundamental difference between the two. When RNA gets transcribed, you don't copy all of the DNA. Remember the cookbook scenario. I just want to make brownies today. I don't want to make anything else. So I don't need to copy every page. I just copy the page I need. So that's RNA transcription. Is you only copy the segment of DNA that you want to make a protein of. So the portion of DNA that you need gets opened up. The RNA polymerase, which only uses RNA nucleotides, will come in and do the same thing that the DNA polymerase did. It'll read the DNA, but instead of using DNA nucleotides as the building blocks, it uses RNA nucleotides as the building blocks. Again, it's C-U-A-A-U-G-U. That will be the complementary nucleotides that the RNA polymerase copies from the DNA template. Now when it's done, the DNA gets closed back up, and now you have your messenger RNA. This is the one that has the template that the ribosome needs to be able to make the protein. All right. Now here is where we talk about the question, if we have only 20 to 25,000 genes, how do we make hundreds of thousands of different proteins? How do you make more proteins than you have templates for? Yeah. Sorry, quick question. Yeah. Going back to what you just finished saying. So uh -huh. Pretty much DNA opens up, RNA comes in, copies, and then pulls back away, and then DNA closes yep. again, and that's why the RNA is just a single strand? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so it doesn't pull all the DNA apart and copy full sets and all that kind of stuff. It just copies one half of it and you just create this single-stranded RNA. Yep. So here is the key. Imagine that you don't want to have a recipe for every possible uh, cookie variation there is. You've got chocolate chip cookies. Maybe you want to add peanuts or peanut butter or peanut butter. Peanut chips to it. Maybe you want to add white chocolate chips, but the basic recipe of the cookie is the same. And that's the same thing here. Some proteins have slight variations that can be modified from the original template. So in fact, the genes say, well, here's the information to make 10 different types of proteins. It's all a matter of how you splice it. And that's really what happens in, in here is once the RNA is made, the cell knows how to remove certain sections and say, ah, I don't want white chocolates, I'm just gonna have regular milk chocolate chips in, in my cookies today. And another day, another cell's like, ah, oh, I, I want both. I want white and ch uh, chocolate chips and the others. I'm getting hungry now. All right, so ultimately, that's how you can take 20,000 templates and make 400,000 different proteins is through what we call splicing. So it literally removes sections of the RNA and only that which gets spliced out and then left behind, which is, don't worry about introns, exons, it's not necessary, it's not even going to show up. The only word that you're going to have to know is splicing, okay? So RNA splicing is the reason why we can make more proteins than we actually have templates for, okay? So... <clears throat> Now, here comes the key. Literally, what is the genetic code? How do the sequence of nucleotides actually make any sense 
to the cell or to the ribosomes that are trying to put it together. Well, you know that binary code is a series of zeros and ones, and that encodes information dependent upon you know, the order of those. Well, this is actually more complex than binary, more involved. Um, these four nucleotides, when they're sequentially arranged, form triplet code <coughs> words called codons. Okay? So every three nucleotides is what we call a codon. And there are multiple versions or variations of these. Let's see if you, for those of you who may know a little bit of math, if we've got six possible nucleotides, uh, let's make this easy to use because we're dealing with RNA here. If we have uh, um, four possible nucleotides with three possible spaces, how many variations are there? How many permutations are there? How many? There are 64 possible codons. Now, here's the secret. What does a codon mean? A codon encodes an amino acid. Okay? One codon literally means a particular amino acid. Now, do you remember how many amino acids are there? There are 20 amino acids in total. But there are 64 possible codons. So you're like, okay. Well, here's what it looks like. There are what we call synonymous codons. Now in English, what's a synonym? Different words that what? Mean the same thing. Synonymous codons are codons that are different in their three nucleotides, but they mean the same amino acid. Now some, there's a lot, like for example, leucine has six synonymous codons, uh, proline has four, histidine has two, so it varies. But here's the fascinating thing, every cell on the planet uses this exact same coding sequence. There is no variation from one species to the next. Everything uses this coding sequence down to the last nucleotide. Okay? Now, some codons don't have synonymous codons. In fact, this one right here, which is one of the more critical codons, the AUG, that's what starts all protein synthesis. So, don't worry about memorizing any of these codons, the relationship between the, the amino acids and the codons, but you do have to understand what synonymous codons are. That comes up in a, in a concept that I will test you on. So, there are more codons than there are amino acids, which means there are these synonymous codons. Now this will become important later on. You'll see how this actually protects us from being more messed up than we actually are. Um, because when mutations occur and they change this nucleotide, it still means the same thing. And we see that over and over again where People may have slightly different genetic codes, but they make their proteins exactly the same. And this is one of those protective measures that we have in our DNA to prevent uh, problems that occur. Instead of, you know, your child comes in and thinks that he's messing up your uh, uh, um, recipe, and he says, oh, two half teaspoons of salt, when it's a teaspoon of salt. You're like, well, I get the same result. So. That's kind of how, how it works, is something gets messed up, but it still means the same thing. You still get the same end result. All right. Now, here's how translation occurs. The tRNAs, which have the amino acids on them, also have a three-coding sequence on their strand called the anticodon. Well, all the anticodon is, is the complementary nucleotides to the codon on the messenger RNA. For example, AUG is the codon. What would be the anticodon for that? GAC. We're starting from left to right. UAC. So there's a tRNA with the anticodon UAC on one end 
And on the other end, it has methionine. Over here, we've got the codon CCC for proline. So there's a tRNA that has the anticodon, what? GGG. So it has the GGG anticodon, which is the complementary pair here, and on the other end, it has a proline. That's where tRNAs play their critical role. It's because the messenger RNA carries the sequence of codons, and as the ribosome reads the messenger RNA, it puts the tRNAs associated with their proper codons, because they've got the anticodon for that, in that order, and then starts putting the amino acids together. So let's see how that works. Now the ribosome is this large protein uh, rRNA complex that basically has two sites in it. And so only two tRNAs can come in at a time. Well, that's fine, and that's how it works, because it will take the two tRNAs, it will covalently bond the amino acids together through dehydration synthesis, and then it'll shift down one and then do the next one. So here's how it happens. Methionine is always the first one. The AUG literally is, like we know that when we're doing a sentence, like the animals, blah, 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 blah. We know what the beginning of the sentence is because it's got a capital letter. Well, we know what the beginning of the sequence of proteins are because it's AUG. That's the universal start site for any protein in any organism. Now, when the tRNA or the ribosome comes in, it now has two slots. The first one's always going to be fitted by the uh, tRNA with the methionine, and then it looks for the next one. Okay, so it's GGA. It'll bring in CCU. That's the only tRNA that will fit in there. All others that try to come in just bounce right back out. Okay, so only the tRNA with the complementary uh, nucleotide sequence, the anticodon, can fit in here. Then it covalently bonds these two amino acids. The ribosome shifts down one spot, and that tRNA will go and be like, oh, I need to go get another methionine. So it'll go from the stockpile of the cell, grab another methionine, and come back to be part of this process. Well, as the ribosome shifts down one, the next tRNA comes in. It covalently bonds the amino acids. Shifts down one, the next one, and so on and so forth, until it finally reaches what we call a stop codon. Now, this is critical as well. Stop codons are the only codons that don't encode an amino acid. I'll show you how I'm going to test you on this here in a second after I show you the video, but um, they don't encode an amino acid. They're the only ones that don't. The start codon does, and all the other codons do, but when you finish, it's kind of like the period at the end. It's not a letter. It's not doesn't mean anything. It just says you're done. Okay? So, all proteins have a beginning, a middle, and an end. All, all codons mean amino acids, one-to-one -one relationship, except for the stop codon. Uh, uh, we'll stop the growing chain and say, you're done. You're done making the protein. Now, these RNAs don't just do a one-to-one. -one. You don't have one, one ribosome copy one RNA. In fact, it forms an assembly line. A single RNA can be copied over and over and over and over and over again. So it literally is an amplification process. One mRNA could be copied thousands of times because the, the protein it needs to make thousands or hundreds of thousands of proteins. Okay? So this just shows an electron scanning micrograph. It's pseudocolored so you can see the ribosomes here and you can see these strings of amino acids uh, that are a result from that. It just kind of forms this assembly line. Once one latches on and starts moving down, another can latch on and move down and so on and so forth. So it's just like putting a paper in the Xerox machine and pressing 1,000. It copies it over and over and over again. Well, here's the problem. And I mentioned this in the beginning. That order of amino acids is critical for the protein's function. If it doesn't get folded properly, then it doesn't have its proper function. So if you mess up even one amino acid due to what we call a mutation, then the protein doesn't get made properly. So let's look at some mutations. There are two types of mutations that I'm going to test you on. The first type of mutation is called a point mutation. Now, when we say point mutation, we mean a substitution for a nucleotide. Okay? 
So here's an example. When your DNA gets copied, or when you're exposed to x-rays, or even just constant exposure to UV radiation, and your DNA gets damaged, your, your cells to regenerate and to renew it kind of pull out a piece of the DNA and then recopy it. Well, every time you have to recopy that portion or repair your DNA, every once in a while it makes some mistakes. Okay? It doesn't make mistakes very often, but it does. Uh, um, uh, the more you're exposed to what we call mutagens, okay? eating Twinkies or going out in the sunlight or whatever. I mean, there's lots of things that can mutate your DNA. Um, so here's an example. Remember we talked about that recipe book, and if you changed it from a teaspoon of salt to a cup of salt, every time you copied it, you're screwing up your brownies. Well, here's an example. Here's the DNA, there's the copy of the RNA, and there's the sequence of amino acids that are associated with the codons. Well, let's say we come in here and exchange this T for an A. Now, when the RNA is made, instead of this codon being GAG, it's going to be the codon GUG. Well, that encodes a different amino acid. And instead of having it proline glutamate glutamate, it's proline valine glutamate. This is one of the causes of sickle cell anemia. A single change in the nucleotide causes the hemoglobin in your red, red blood cells to collapse. And the cells form this sickle shape and they can't carry oxygen, hence the anemia. Um, so a single change in a nucleotide can screw up how the protein gets folded and cause these genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia and Tay-Sachs disease and the like. Okay, so that's a point mutation, is when you change a nucleotide on the DNA and it ultimately can cause a different amino acid. Now, that's not as bad as you might think actually. Why? Because, come back to here, what if the point mutation occurs right here? Will anything happen? What if it occurs on the third nucleotide on the DNA, and instead of CCU, the, the codon now becomes CCC? It won't change the amino acid. So this is why I told you that because we have synonymous codons, there's some protection there. You can accidentally get a point mutation, but if it's in that spot where you have a synonymous codon, then nothing happens. Because the same amino acids are put in the same order, no problems whatsoever. All right, so the second type of mutation that we're gonna talk about is called a frame shift mutation. So a frame shift is when the reading frame of the nucleotide sequence shifts down one. Now there's a couple of ways which this can come about. Um, usually it comes about through either an insertion or a deletion of nucleotides. So let me pull up the PowerPoint here real quick. So here's an example of a frame shift. You've got the original DNA sequence up above, and if you add a nucleotide, say this T right here, what happens is, remember that the ribosome can only read every three nucleotides, every codon. And if you add one, then it shifts that reading frame down one so that all of these codons are going to be different. Okay? To illustrate how this works, Love dogs, hate cats. Um, so, if you have like a point mutation, that's where you substitute one letter for the other, but look, it doesn't really affect anything else. You get the same sentence, same meaning or whatnot. So it all depends upon where that substitution is. But let's say you add a letter, add a nucleotide. Well, it doesn't all of a sudden do this, okay? Remember, it only reads it every three. So it shifts everything down and it doesn't make sense and the same thing is true for this frame shift so a frame shift mutation is when you have an addition or deletion you can actually take nucleotides away they get mistakenly taken out and it shifts the reading frame and 
you pretty much screw it up. There, there's, no, there's not really anything coming back from that one.